Kessel and Z has unipotent elements. This is actually non compact. But uh, this is also something useful which uh, I might be interested. This Mather's compactness criteria, which says the following that when a sequence T and I just uh, let me just uh, state the theorem. Yeah, so here is a criteria which says that if you have this SLN this thing, you'd like to know when a sequence a GN gamma gamma. <laughs> yeah. so, like no, uh, when this gn gamma go to infinity, here is another, uh, we have seen one criteria, but here is another thing that you, as gn gamma go to infinity, there is a gn sequence of uh, integral vectors, non-zero integral vectors, so that limit of gn, gn go to zero. Okay? So we are going to prove this. So yeah, so there are some simple observations one needs to make. Uh, this is not practical. So uh, yeah, so uh, you see, you remember my a two by root three was. Uh, the diagonal elements so that a i i by a i plus one the roots the positive roots they, they take the value less than two by root three on the diagonal and these are positive entries. So uh, a i two by a two by root three a subscript two by root three is the elements those diagonal is the positive so that this lambda i a is two by root three. Recall that lambda i a was defined by Lambda i a is a i i by a i plus one i plus one. Okay. <clears throat> it is, if you know the roots, then it is the positive roots, diagonal matrix. And there is a very simple fact that if b, uh, if, I may recall that n, n was the upper triangular with the diagonal one, that group of upper triangular matrix with the diagonal one. And suppose b is a relatively compact set in n. Then this union A B A inverse is also a relatively compact. That is a bounded set. That is easy to easy to see because all the roots, all the roots are bounded by two by root three. So this is essentially uh, very easy to see. So here is a if you want. <coughs> see if I conjugate by like this, what I get is uh, a form like this. Yeah, I, I am taking AI, X, X, I, J, I, J, E, I, J is the, you know, one at I, J, everyone, everywhere it is zero. And N is uh, sort of, uh, of this form. N is generated by groups of this form. If you do like this, then you have this. And all these things are bounded by 2 by root 3. So it is going to be power of 2 by root 3. Okay, so it is, uh, it says that uh, this is a bound set. It is just a simple matrix calculation. Okay, so I'm sending this down. Yeah, and here is another simple <coughs> lemma. It says, uh, oh, if, if, uh, if A11, uh, if I take elements here, then this A11 is less than some very constant C, so that A11 is less than C. And the second thing says that if I'm um, given for every B greater than zero, there is a constant alpha i theta i for i equal to 2 to n, alpha i less than theta i. So that if A11 is greater than B, then all the other entries, I mean, of course, A11 is bounded by this, all the other entries are also bound. Solid. And that is uh, easy to prove because of the following fact. Because you see, here is a very simple fact but useful one. So, if you remember the formula for lambda i, you will see that a lot of cancellation makes this uh, thing happen. A i i is lambda i up to lambda j minus 1 a, a j j. And 
just keep cancelling and we arrive at that. So and all these lambda i uh, a and lambda j a i e, these are all bounded. So a i i is essentially uh, there is a constant c i j. So for any i j one less than equal this thing happens that there is a constant c i j that this happens and I'm I'm my a this entry is uh, a i i is here in this set a two by a. So this is something useful and we are going to use this repeatedly to prove this. Uh, okay. So the first thing is A, the first entry is bounded that is because of A11 is C1J. A11 is C1J, AJJ for all J is zero equal to one. And you remember this, we are in a matrix with determinant one. So if you just multiply this uh, inequality, you get C I C I J. So A one one, you just multiply with this, and you get, and uh, you know, on the right hand side, the determinant is one. So basically, A one one is some less than some constant. That's all you need to prove. And the second thing is uh, again. Uh, okay, and the second thing is. Uh, so I am assuming that the first entry is more than B for some, if you are given that the first entry is more than B, then you know, the same kind of manipulation gives us uh, the AJJ is uh, bigger than some constant for all J. And this AN, and since again I am using the fact that the determinant is uh, determinant is 1, so ANN is uh, this, which is less than equal to 1 by this. Less than delta, so ANN is bounded by this, and other AIIs are by that old formula that I have written. AIIs are less than CIN. So we are essentially done. Uh, so first of all, remember this: the, the diagonal entry. If I concentrate only at that subset A two by root three, the first entry is bounded above, and if the first entry is bounded below, then all the entries are bounded. That's all. Uh, okay, and that allows us to. Yeah, now, uh, now here is the lemma that if I'm given a sequence in uh, a n a sequence of matrices in a two by root three, so that a n gamma go to infinity. Uh, that is living compact sets uh, for large n. Then the first entry of the matrices, they go to zero. That's the, the thing. Uh, so, so it is uh, proved using the previous uh, simple observation that we made. So, since a n gamma go to infinity, so does limit a n. So, a n uh, does not have any convergence of sequence. So, suppose the limit is not zero. That means there is a subsequence which stays away from zero. So that means there is a b for which uh, the, sub, the first entry of the subsequence is bounded below by B. And that means all the other entries are bounded because of the previous lemma. And that means ANK, the sequence ANK admits a convergent subsequence, which is a contradiction. Okay. So, okay, so here you mean implement AN gamma equal to infinity? Yeah. A n go to infinity, which is a contrary, and a n gamma go to infinity, so a n go to infinity. So if you want a n, that is a contradiction to the fact a n gamma go to infinity. Okay, now uh, here is a Mahler's criteria. So uh, you see this side is easy to prove, why? Right? Because I have this uh, two uh, distinct quality. So this side is easy to prove because if gn, en, suppose I have this situation that there is en zn minus zero so that uh, limit of gn, en go to zero. And suppose uh, this admits, uh, suppose the contrary, that I am going to prove this thing here. Suppose it admits a convergence subsequence. That means there is a gn, so there is a subsequence gnk if you reinterpret in terms of the group level. Uh, to have a convergent subsequence means there is a subsequence GNK and a gamma NK in gamma and a H 
in G so that G N K gamma N K go to H. And if you just G N K gamma N gamma N K gamma N K inverse E N. So G N K gamma N K go to H. So if you just plug that H gamma N K E N K go to zero. But gamma N is in S L N Z. So this means gamma N K E N K go to zero, which is not possible because we are in a discrete set unless they are identical. Because gamma N K E N K lies inside Z N minus. Okay, so this one side is group, the other side is uh, also is group, but just using the previous facts. <coughs> you see, we need to make a simple observation that we have proved that any element G after all, SLN uh, G can be written like this. Any element is a product like this, K. So any element can be written as, uh, so any element can, G and gamma can be written as K and A and U N, where K N is K, A N is here, and U N is here. But this, I can conjugate A N U N, A, I can write this as A N U N, A N inverse K N. And this a n u n a n inverse lies in a compact set inside n gamma n half inside n because I am here n half is bounded and this is a two by three is bounded so this proves that g n gamma go to infinity from our leaf a n gamma go to infinity so so if you assume g n gamma go to infinity then a n gamma go to infinity. And that means by the previous lemma, the first entry go to zero. Yeah, this is go to zero. And that is equivalent to saying that, you know, an e1 go to zero. And I write down that kn, this, this I call it as beta n. K, kn, an e1, an inverse I call it as beta n. That is, so I just multiply. So a beta n lies in a compact set. So this is go to zero means I, if I... Uh, multiply by something compact that also goes to zero. So K N A N U N E one go to zero. And K N E U N K N A N U N differs from G N by an element of gamma N. <coughs> so G N gamma N E one go to zero. And gamma N E one is the element E N you can write. Okay. So that goes to zero. So we have to Mahler's criteria for something going to infinity. Uh, how it uh, interprets in terms of the uh, axiomatic integral vectors. Okay, so this uh, will help us to prove this uh, criteria that uh, a group uh, now uh, control. Oh, I want to get rid of this slide. Okay, let's go. Uh, everywhere it is a little different. So, uh, that, uh, but before that, I need to have some little bit of preliminaries on. Uh, uh, algebraic groups. So let me just, uh, it will be useful later also. Okay, I'll just stick to this page setting. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, we are need, need to use the language of linear algebraic groups. So let us uh, do that in a very naive way. So K be a field and F be an algebraically closed field uh, so that K is inside F. By a linear algebraic group H defined over K, we mean H is a subgroup. So F is an algebraically uh, closed field. So it's a group of SLN F for some N. H is a zero set of some SLN in SLN F for some polynomial in variable X, I, J with coefficients in K. And there are some de more definitions we need. We put the Zariski topology on J H by declaring closed sets to be zero sets of polynomials. And we have this map from H1, which is defined over K, and H2 is also defined over K. We are sitting inside two different SL. And the map is set to be algebraic and defined over K if uh, the map is a restriction of some polynomial map with coefficients in K. And if that map happens to be a group homomorphism, we call it a homomorphism to find what k. So everything is polynomial here. And when it is defined what k means those polynomials have coefficients in k. That's all we need to remember. 
And uh, suppose uh, it is uh, connected, and then <coughs> I need to define dimension. So you have this FH is going to be an integral domain. Is some fact and about George. Then you can form the quotient field and take the transcendence degree. That's that's going to be the that's how I'm called, going to call the dimension of the H. So, uh, for example, dimension of S L N F is n square minus uh, one. G L N F is n square, and so on. I mean, dimensions are many many places. Uh, it is also comes from an object called G algebra. And I need to <coughs> define what is the the case fit for us. So H is uh, as before a group defined over K. And T is uh, said to be a case fit torus, a subgroup, a just con a closed subgroup defined over K, uh, which is, I mean, T is a closed, just a closed subgroup defined over K. Uh, that means it is given by some zero sets of poly polynomials in uh, coefficients in K. It is said to be a case fit torus if uh, you can find an H, uh, H, the K points are. H intersection, I forgot to define what are K points. So K points uh, is precisely like like So remember H was SLNF. So HK is all the matrices with uh, entries of K. So this is my definition. And uh, the T is said to be a uh, case fit torus. If there is H in uh, HK, so that you know, one, if you conjugate T by this H, then this leaves inside the diagonal subgroup of SLNF. Okay. And this is so the K rank of H is. Uh, Dimension of the maximal case fit torus of H. It's a theorem that all these maximal case fit tori are conjugate by elements of the K points in H. So it doesn't really, uh, really uh, depend on uh, a fixed maximal case fit torus. K rank of H is dimension of uh, maximal case fit torus. Like you have SLN, then you have the G rank. A rank is SLN R, for example. SLN is defined over Q, so Q rank is N minus 1. And so the diagonal is the maximum case vectors. That's the simplest example. Okay, so with this, uh, I need another fact from algebraic group, which is called Schiavelli's theorem, which says the following. So if you have a linear algebraic group defined over K, and H is a K closed subgroup, then there is a K representation rho e to GLV for some vector space V with a K structure. That means there is a K, uh, uh, the K structure means there is a K subspace so that if you tensor with uh, F, you get K by V. Uh, so that, and there is a Correspondingly, there is a point in the projective space, so that H is precisely. So when you have a uh, representation, the G acts on the corresponding projective space. So H is precisely the stabilizer of. Uh, so if you are given a K closed subgroup, there is a point V in the projective space uh, e v k so that H is precisely the stabilizer of. Uh, H is preserved this the that point. Or you can think of that H is uh, precisely stabilizer of that line passing through it because projective space is just a set of lines. Since it is uh, H is keeping this line stable, H is acting on this particular line by a character. That means a homomorphism from character defined over that field K. So if you happen to know that there is no character, on the group, so here is a, uh, 
useful thing which we are going to use. So I have written Q character, but you can there's a, there's a typo here. This is no error to the clear. You should write K character other than the trivial one. Then uh, then since H is acting by character, this H is precisely the uh, stabilizer of. Okay, so with this uh, preliminary, I'm going to uh, go ahead to the next slide. And here is a theor useful theorem to know when a uh, lattice is co-compact, and that is precisely in a semicircle group when uh, there is no uniform element or the corresponding corresponding group is Q and isotropic. Okay, so here is, uh, let, me, let me just state the theorem and then do it like I, probably I should write the statement always in the beginning. But, so, G is a semi-simple group over, defined over Q. Uh, if you don't know semi-simple group, it is just, you can think of it as an SLM or a normal like, SON or matrix group, SPN, So G is a semi-simple group defined over Q. The formal definition of semi-simple group is you don't have the uh, solved radical is identity. There is something called solved radical for the maximal normal connected solver subgroup identity. So G is one such group but defined over Q. Then uh, this uh, this is just a discrete uh, subgroup. But this is co-compact if and, if and only if GQ has uh, no non-trivial unipotent element. Okay. So this is the theorem that we are going to do. Unipotent element is an uh, element which is, uh, I mean, if you, when you embed inside SLN, then you get a unipotent matrix. Corresponding element should be unipotent matrix. And it, this doesn't really depend on the element. These are theorems, uh, non-trivial theorems, but we assume moment the definition of unipotence it doesn't depend on that so, <coughs> so let us go ahead and prove this theorem but uh, we need certain lemmas Finite extensions of number of is it G is defined over Q of Q group. So this so Yeah, this but I'm talking only talking about Z points. But the number field will come later when I uh, uh, <coughs> uh, I mean that's not going to be uh, GR by GQ of uh, OF it need not be lattice also. It will be going to be lattice sometime, but not all of it. Instead of Z considering G for Q. Yeah, I mean, so but that's that's not going to be discrete always. Then go. So then look like but Z plus root two Z is not a discrete subgroup of R. The ten subgroup. But Z plus root 2Z when you embed inside R plus R as yeah. A plus B and a minus I, that's a discrete. So I don't know when, when you divide by 10 subgroup, it's. Uh, <coughs> okay, for uh, so, uh, so we first uh, assume that there is uh, G is a Q group, and Q group means, you know. Uh, polynomials is zero set of Q and we have this uh, take embedding row and suppose that there is no Q character then this map so we are in a homogeneous space uh, there is a map I am assuming this row row uh, GZ is defined via this embedding okay GZ is precisely defined via this embedding okay that is GZ is uh, if you happen to 
So if you take rho to be identity G J. Yes. So intersection. So, I'm just taking the root of the identity. Okay. <coughs> yeah, jet points are not very intrinsically defined in jet embedding, but up to different embedding, this will give a common suitable subject. So, as far as this kind of properties are concerned, it is not a problem. Okay, so this map is, uh, since uh, we want to prove that if there is no Q character, then this map is proper. Okay, once we prove that, then we, we uh, the strategy is if some sequence GN, GZ go to infinity, that will ensure that GN, SLMZ go to infinity. Because proper maps take infinite and something going to infinity, something going to infinity. Okay, so apply Chevalier's theorem that we have mentioned just now, and we have this SLN. I am assuming that SLN G is sitting inside SLN. I am assuming for simplicity that rho is identity, and uh, so there is a representation of SLN in SLN SLM, so that G is precisely the stabilizer of uh, this thing. Of that vector in VQ. Okay, so to prove that uh, this is a close, uh, this is a proper map, it is enough to prove that this is a close subset, and that follows from their category theorem. You can try it. And <coughs> if you interpret what, what is, if you interpret the quotient topology and you want to say that this is close, it is as good as showing G is this. This object is closed in, should be, it should be SLNR. Okay, there's a pipe okay. And since it's, uh, that is equal, same as showing that, you know, SLNZ, GR is closed in GR. And here is the proof. First of all, this SLN, you remember that I'm having a representation psi for which the stabilizer of V is precisely GR. So, psi is that uh, stabilizer, psi is defined over Q by the way. So, psi of SLN Z V is a discrete set inside V. You have appropriate basis and then it goes inside 1 by L for some fixed integer L, 1 by L Z to the power M. So, it is a discrete closed set. And uh, so, I, we are trying to prove that this is closed. This is SLNR, but this is closed. So, yeah, so if you, since uh, that is a discrete <coughs> set, phi inverse phi SLN Z B is also going to be a closed set, discrete set, inverse unit of a closed set. And that is precisely SLN Z times GR. This is also, here is a type of which you prefer for that is B. So that proves the fact that. SLN Z uh, times GR is a closed set inside SLN. Okay, once you have this, and this next fact is uh, another simple but uh, somewhat useful fact is G is a group defined over Q and consider the Lie algebra G of uh, G and Arvind are defined what a Lie algebra is. And then there is a polynomial. P, so Lie algebra is a you know vector space, and then uh, it is also uh, it has a, since G is a defined over Q, it has all, all got a Q structure also. So there is a polynomial with uh, from G to C with the coefficients in Q, so that it has this nice property that this is uh, a joint representation invariant, and P V is zero if and only if V is add mutable. If P is in GQ, then PV is zero. I, I should I should say that if P is in GQ, then PV is zero. If and only P is admin product. Okay, and uh, about the yeah, here is a proof, nice proof. So you take X in G, 
and then <clears throat> you just take uh, determinant of add x. Add x is the operator on g which takes uh, every y to x bracket y, and I take the, uh, the characteristic polynomial of that. You take this, and it's going to be of this form for some bunch of polynomials in g. And you see this uh, this uh, from Lie group. You know this property that uh, this happens. So this is these two maps. This and this these are conjugate. So the determinant of this is same as the determinant of add x. In other words, you just write down what is happening from here in, in terms of this this equation. Then you will see that f i of add x is f i of x for every x in g. So now this uh, f i has uh, coefficients in q, so I am just taking the square in p x. Okay. So p x I am defining to be square of <coughs> this bunch of polynomials, square and sum of this bunch of polynomials. And of course, if v is in the q point, v is a q point inside the Lie algebra. Then, since f i has f i are also in q of uh, f i has coefficients in q. These are all in uh, elements of Q. So PV is zero if and only if IV is zero, provided V is in G. In other words, determinant of P minus at V is T to the power N. So if V, okay, if PV is zero, that means this is zero. That means determinant of P minus at V is T to the power N. That is the same as saying this, at V is uh, nil Okay. So this is going to be, uh, a nil potent operator that means some power of it is uh, going to be zero. Okay, and converse is z. So now uh, let us prove this. Okay, now let us prove that if G is a semi simple tree Q group and gamma is a uh, gamma is the z points and Gn is in Gr, then Gn gamma go to infinity. If you if you are given that gn gamma go to infinity, then gq has a non-trivial unit. Okay, essentially we are going to show that uh, the Lie algebra has a non-trivial nilpotent element. Lie algebra, the q points of the Lie algebra has non-trivial nilpotent. <coughs> and if you exponentiate a nilpotent element, that means these are matrix uh, groups, so you know what is the meaning of exponential of a nilpotent matrix. It's a finite xi by i factorial, and since x to the power n is zero for higher n, it, uh, the exponential is going to be. So all we are going to prove that the Lie algebra GQ has a non-trivial nilpotent, and we are going to use this. Uh, so uh, since G is <coughs> it doesn't have any character, so and we can embed insights. SLN uh, that you consider that joint representation, and we have seen that uh, G sits inside SLN G since G is semi simple. And uh, since G and G and gamma go to infinity, uh, and since this map is proper, we have seen this map is proper using uh, proof it just now. So that is equal to saying that this add GN. SLN, so SLN, SLN of G, SLG of Z is a lattice in SLG of R. That is of, that we have proved. SLN R, SLN Z is a lattice in SLN. And this map is proper, so add G and SLN Z go to infinity. Okay. And now we apply Mahler's criteria to my vector space, which is integral points of the Lie algebra. So there is a en which is not zero so that if you just uh, uh, <coughs> apply Mahler's criteria it looks like add g and en go to zero. Okay. Again, none of en are going to zero. But now take uh, that polynomial that we have on the Lie algebra which has the property that you know if a q point has that uh, polynomial is a zero, uh, which in the Q point, that Q point must be important. I'm taking that uh, polynomial, which is adding very interesting. Mm -hmm. So we have this, this thing. Okay. Okay, so P 
of gn so you see that p of add gn go to zero since this go to zero and p of n since this add gn invariant p of n exists go to zero but p p is a polynomial over q and my n are integral points so again it lies in a discrete set value of p of n lies in a fixed so this says that pn of n must be zero for large n and in other words if i use the property of a polynomial this says that pn is new for sure it's all i wanted to prove and if you exponentiate en then you get a non trivial so from Yeah, and the other side, uh, we uh, so we have proved. Uh, so let us finally prove this Goldman criteria. So G is semi-simple over Q, then Gj is co-compact in GR if and only if Gq has a non-trivial unit. We have proved one side that we have proved just now using the gemma. Let us prove the other side. Suppose it has Gq has a non-trivial unipotent element. Okay, say E. And then we have this uh, Jacobson Menelov theorem, which is very useful. Uh, it's a very uh, well known fact in uh, the D theory, which says that there is a Q homomorphism with uh, a finite kernel, so that of this is essential to G, so that this row of uh, upper triangular is exactly this unipotent. So for power of it is going to, so it is an unipotent element since it is defined over Q, so this uh, image is a point in GQ, oh, of course we know that image is a point in GQ, so some power of it lies inside GZ, so I just take rho 1 over n, n, 0, 0 to GN, then if you apply this to alpha you get this element, and you see that my everything is fixed except if I vary my n, I have a, I have a division by n square, then it goes to zero. So I have obtained, so for this Q, I have obtained a bunch of element Gn, Gn inverse in the group Gr, so that this goes to zero. Yeah. And that says, you recall that uh, we have proved uh, and this u alpha is in gn and it is non trivial. Okay? u to the power alpha is in gj, which is non trivial. That says that you know gn, gn gamma go to infinity. <coughs> okay, and since gn gamma go to, I have a sequence here, I am giving you a sequence which go to infinity, the space cannot be broken. So this is the proof of what my criteria and so uh, you recall uh, SLN this say proof that SLN Z is a non-co-compact lattice inside <coughs> because SLN Z has a lot of unipotent element. If that if any upper triangular matrix with diagonal one, that's going to be unipotent element. You take some non-zero entries from the above the diagonal, that's going to be non-trivial element. Okay, so yeah, so now let me state uh, the major theorems without, for certain, without proof. But uh, there are several typos. Uh, I seem to have lost that slide. Okay, I'll probably write it down. Yeah, something is not copied, or maybe I don't have that slide here. Huh? Uh, yeah, but it doesn't matter. So I'll probably now it's time to make the board. So. Yeah, so now uh, there's a very, uh, I'll state two theorems, 
which are the very big major terms for this uh, subject. One is Boyle. So it is a huge generalization of the fact that SLN Z is a lattice in SLN R. This is the following. So G is a group. Has no contrivial <laughs> then. I need to define something called. So as you see, it is a huge. You take any two groups without any key character, and that's going to be a lattice. Okay, and that lattice is uh, compact, Ethernal leaf. So if I assume that group two is semi-simple, this lattice is compact, Ethernal leaf. Uh, this G is a Q anisotropic. In other words, it doesn't have any new quantity. Or there is no uh, Q rank is zero. So, irreducible lattice is uh, the idea is uh, you see you take G1 cross G2 and take a lattice gamma 1 here, gamma 2 here, <coughs> then gamma 1 cross gamma 2. If this is a lattice, so roughly when a lattice in G1 cross G2 can be written like this, gamma 1 cross gamma 2, if a group is like this, roughly you have a lattice and a group. So for this lattice, if I can find two close subgroups G1 and G2 so that this group can be written as direct product like this, and if I find a lattice here, lattice here, so that this light, lattice is the product of these two lattice, then we call that lattice to be reduced roughly. There is a, a little bit of technical it is involved. But in other, if it doesn't happen, then we call, if you cannot break up the lattice into smaller lattices, product of smaller lattices, then we call it a irreducible lattice. And here is the mechanism. So that's the idea. So, a lattice, gamma, so maybe for, from now on, uh, G is uh, a semi-simple uh, and without. Normal or it doesn't act, this is the same as saying it doesn't act in any compact factor. Okay. So yeah, that is gamma in G said to be reducible if uh, there exist two H1, H2 normal subgroup dimension of H1, H2, H1 and 
lattices, gamma 1 inside H1, gamma 2 inside H2, such that the following goes, for 1, G is almost direct product of H1, H2, and this is just this product, security product, whatever, product of things, and H1, H2 is this discrete, and gamma, gamma intersection H1, gamma, sorry, uh, yeah, gamma intersection H2, is finite, or this subgroup is a finite index subgroup. <coughs> Finite. Okay, so if it happens, if this is reducible, and uh, if something is not reducible, we call it reducible. Irreducible otherwise. Gamma is irreducible. Gamma is reducible. That means you cannot find such a decomposition of gamma. Okay, irreducible otherwise. There are many equivalent conditions for reducibility. It says also that for any uh, uh, normal subgroup uh, N of G, any uh, closed normal subgroup of uh, N of G of positive dimension on G mod uh, N, the, the gamma projection to the dense subgroup of G mod N for any normal subgroup. The, the, the role of gamma 1, gamma 2 yeah. is not clear in the definition. Uh, they, they no, I am saying that this is reducible. If if you have if you can get H1 and H2 normal closed subgroup in positive dimension so that and lattices gamma 1 here and gamma 2 here, so that G can be written as almost direct product, that G is H1 H2 and H1 and H2 is discrete, and gamma by this is uh, gamma 1, gamma 2 are not the uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, or maybe, yeah, uh, maybe come on. Ah. Okay. Or maybe uh, the best thing is forget this. That might be a confusion. Or, yeah. Which one? Thank you. Yeah, there is a time. So yeah. the intersections play the. They are the discrete uh, subgroups of H1. Of course. The bigger one is discrete, so. And gamma, yeah. Another thing is, yeah, I should say that. Uh, and then I have to add one more line. Gamma I intersection H. That is. Gamma <coughs> intersection H. Gamma intersection H I. <laughs> yeah. So basically, the idea is if you can break up the uh, lattice into a product of lattices, and um, it is I am taking care of up to finite index things. That's the that's why it is written like this. I mean, H one and H one and H two can pick up some discrete subgroup, um, some intersection. Okay, so. Yeah, and this is equivalent to saying that there is a lot of equivalent conditions. Uh, you can, so this is equivalent to saying that uh, for any closed normal subgroup, the projection from G to G mod N, uh, closed normal subgroup N, the projection from G to G mod N takes gamma to a dense subgroup. Okay, so uh, now, yeah, now some basic, uh, probably I'll erase the this one and this the other part. Now there are two uh, simple things that we need to make. <coughs> so one fact is suppose uh, some facts, easy facts. One is Suppose G to H, I have a 
subjective man, subjective who wants it. There are all these books. What's that? Kernel of Pi is called back. Then, if gamma is a lattice in G, then so is pi gamma. First of all, this map is a proper map. <coughs> the kernel is compact, so it takes this thing. It's to discrete. So the and discrete close subgroup is the pi gamma is only discrete close subgroup. And moreover, again for the same reason it is going to be lattice. You can think about it. And basically uh, call this as uh, put is you call this gamma dash then from G mod gamma H mod gamma dash, which is pi of gamma. You have a natural map coming from phi and you take the push forward of so I have a finite gene variant model and this map is homomorphism so there is a uh, for the action of phi there is a homomorphism here so that push forward measure for this will be a, and this is finite so that's regularity is taken care of so that's going to tell you the push forward measure is the measure which is going to remain H invariant for the action of H here. So, uh, in particular, <coughs> pi gamma is like this. So, what we have observed is if, if I have a group and a subjective homomorphism with a compact kernel, then a lattice goes to the lattice. Second fact is second fact is very easy. I mean, if uh, if gamma 1, gamma 2 are two groups, discrete subgroups, and suppose they are common suitable, is that gamma 1 intersects in gamma 2, and gamma i, that is, this intersection is finite index in both, both, the, both the discrete subgroup, so all i is equal to 1 2, that is, that is the definition of common suitability. If one is a lattice, then the other is a lattice. Okay? That is also a very easy to show. If such, then gamma one <coughs> lattice. Gamma lattice. So what do we have from Borel Harishchandra is the following. Okay, probably how you have to the previous thing. Okay, but then uh, later on again, I need the. Uh, so, in the first bit, where are we exactly using the number of files to compact? Where are we using compactness of kernel of files? Compactness of kernels is used to prove that this map is a proper map. Unless uh, from G. Where is the map is a proper map, so it uh, takes a discrete subgroup to a discrete subgroup. Otherwise, it's not guaranteed that things will go to discrete. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, now you see that uh, the conclusion from all this and Borel Harishchandra is the following. Uh, so suppose uh, I have a Q group. Suppose I'm G is over Q without Q character. And suppose uh, suppose H is another link. And suppose I have a subjective map from G to H. I should say G 
she ought to age. Subjective monomorphism. With, uh, with compact kernel, <coughs> then and suppose let gamma be a discrete subgroup. Such that gamma commensurable, gamma commensurable, gamma common with phi of g of z. Then, since g of z is a lattice, g of r, by, I am assuming this one. Uh, by Borel Lorentz standard, g of z is a lattice in g of r. This says that the conclusion is gamma is a lattice. This is my conclusion. Okay, this is a conclusion from the famous Borel Lorentz standard and from these two simple operators. Okay. So. You see, gamma in some sense is appearing from some very pretty construction. My G is defined over Q, when there is a Q, I am doing arithmetic. So this, if I am given gamma such that, suppose I to start with, I have a H, and I have a gamma, a discrete subgroup of gamma, so that I can find the appropriate G with no Q character, so that and a subjective homomorphism from GR to P, so that my gamma commensurates with P of GZ, then gamma is a lattice. Okay. So gamma is coming from some arithmetic construction, and this is precisely the definition, the general definition of arithmetic group. So a group H, so a group, a discrete subgroup H, Sorry, gamma in H is said to be arithmetic. If you can find a group defined over Q, so arithmetic. If I can find another group defined over Q. So that you know, I'm a subject of homomorphism with compact kernel. So that uh, G of Z commensurate with gamma, then gamma is correct. So it was uh, it was Margulis who proved that if I have a H, so the question is, so arithmetic groups are lattices. This is what it says from Borel addition. Margulis proved the converse, but with a mild restriction that if, <coughs> if I take a semi simple uh, real Lie group or real algebraic group defined over, or an uh, algebraic group defined over R, and you take the real points that will be the real, uh, real Lie group, if the rank of the real Lie group, the R rank of the real Lie group is greater or equal to 2, then any lattice is a that's what the statement of Margulis is. Okay. So, so Margulis. It's a converse of Borel and Chandra. So if H is over R, uh, R rank, H is sensible. Let's say H is sensible. Mm. 
and any lattice. And uh, uh, there are one can pin down what are the R rank one groups, and there are other mathematicians who prove for certain R rank one group, groups, and there are counter examples given by uh, in R rank one groups, like in any groups it is the any lattice is a degree and there are other groups. <coughs> I will not go into that, but uh, there are certainly some cases open for R rank 1, like SU N1 for higher ends is not known whether that is a different one. That is the only thing which is which remains of the real Okay, so this is the marvelous arithmetic. So, in view of marvelous arithmetic theorem, uh, it is important to look at if you want to study lattices, look at arithmetic groups. Okay. So, one would like to see uh, arithmetic groups and uh, construction of arithmetic groups in sensibility groups, and which is what we are going to concentrate on the next few minutes that we have. Yeah, so uh, the problem is uh, is. Easier to construct, uh, no, uh, as you said, the GZ is always a lattice, so it is already it's an axiom. But uh, if you want to ensure co compactness, you need more water, which is. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, the theorem of Borel says that you know you can always uh, find a Q form of a semi simple group defined over R, which is an isotope. In other words, the Z point is a co compact like this. That's the theorem of So, as Arunda needs uh, that co compact portions, the theorem of for any semi Okay, so let us uh, see an uh, uh, important uh, tool called well restriction, and which is what we are going to do now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I probably will uh, use the board now. I use the white, uh, white. Yeah, the projector now. I think I have. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is a. Uh, this is going to be a little long. I don't want to do uh, do anything about well restriction, but probably uh, just give some examples. And at least probably straight what well restriction means. So now, how do I make it? Uh, yeah. So, full screen. I may forget it. I'm just going to do this. Yeah, so, well, restriction of scalars tell you how a recipe to. So uh, I'd like to quickly define this and uh, give the formal definition and the yeah. construction, but without any proof. It's like uh, looking at uh, the complex numbers as complex manifold as real money. It's you want to see the complex points as real points, but then the dimension of the origin, original variety get doubled. So that's precisely the thing. I mean, if you want to look at complex group as real groups, that's the thing. Complex point of that group, if you want to look at uh, real points of some other group, then the original dimension, if it's a new group, the dimension is double. That is precisely going on here. So uh, you have a, yeah, so as before means this is a, now, this is a, this is an algebraically closed field which contains k, not necessarily algebraic over k. And I have a finite extension of k, 
and I will give the category type definition, the universal property type definition. So now I, I suppose that F is the bigger field, which is a finite extension of K, and V is a variety which is a fine, let's assume for the for our purpose. Then uh, the pair, uh, so the, this is going to be a, so there exists a pair, I denote by Rf by K or V pi, where Rf by K is a fine K variety, and there is a F morphism such that you know, it has this universal property that W is W phi is another. So I don't know whether yeah, it looks a bit complicated, but this is something probably uh, not a lot. W is a pair where W is a K variety. So I'm starting with a V is a F variety. I'd like to get hold of a K variety. And you remember, F is a finite extension of K, which I call, uh, I'd like to get a K variety and an F map. V is a, <coughs> F map makes sense because it's something K variety is also a F variety. So F map makes sense between these two. Uh, if there is a, with this property that if there is a, is, W phi is a pair where W is a K variety and phi from W to V is a F morphism, then there is a unique K morphism by tilde from W to V, so that is kind of complex. So once it's like uh, many things with the universal property, but once you show the existence, it's going. Okay. So let us uh, not bother about the existence and uniqueness, uh, the construction of the uniqueness is always an easy thing when you have such things defined in this way, but existence is the problem. So, <coughs> we just need to write down what the existence is, which is, we in fact, uh, many books in linear algebra group, particularly if you look at the Springer's book on algebra groups, it might have this. Yeah, but our characteristic zero field it is easy to construct. I, I, I wrote down the construction for my lectures at Almora. But, uh, here is here is the construction. Okay, first uh, V is. Uh, V is a variety, first embed V inside some affine space. Affine space has a natural a structure or whatever, Q structure. And we have this distinct uh, embedding since F is, am I assume that K has characteristics here. And suppose the degree extension is R, so we have distinct embedding sigma on sigma R inside, the, inside omega. And uh, for our clarity's sake, let us assume that uh, uh, sigma m is identity. And then we consider v sigma 1 to v sigma n. What is v sigma 1? Uh, so v is given by some uh, zero sets of some polynomial with coefficients in f. I apply sigma 1 to that uh, coefficient and the corresponding zero set of the polynomials changed by, whose coefficients are changed by applying this sigma 1 is called v sigma 1. And similarly, all the other things. So then we can put a case structure on this variety V sigma and V sigma R so that this map PM, if the sigma is in the identity, PM I am taking the MF projection, that map is going to be the map pi that we talked about before in the universal property. So basically putting a case structure on this V sigma 1 to V sigma R. And the most important fact is the K points with respect to the case structure, the K points is precisely sigma 1 V sigma r where v is in here okay that means v has coordinates with coefficients in f i just apply this uh, embedding field embedding to the corresponding coordinates so the more this is the most important fact that we are going to look at so these are going to uh, give us a lot of lattices and similarly oh, don't have time, or much time, or how much time? Or? Three minutes. One five. One five. So I'll do it quick. Yeah, so let's.
let us now uh, be specific and look at uh, the number field. So k is a q and f is a finite extension. And for our uh, purpose, we take omega to be c. And uh, you know, any you have this uh, real embedding that is uh, the image of f is going inside R, and we have this complex embedding that is not inside R. So complex embedding occurs in conjugate pairs. <coughs> so let us uh, uh, enumerate the complex embedding. Then we are going to see what uh, the real point of this restriction looks like. We have this complex embedding uh, and real embedding. Then we arrange. We arrange like this. We are in a situation where the base field is number q and then we have a number field f over q. And suppose the sigma 1 to sigma l are the real embeddings and sigma yes, yeah, sigma l plus 1 to sigma t and sigma t plus 1 to sigma r are the complex embedding with the property that this uh, I have to focus on the correct point. Yeah, with the property that you know this uh, Sigma sigma L plus 1, L plus T plus 1. Yeah, I mean, you just pair the complex embedding. Okay, then I believe you may see. So, so, first of all, club all the real embeddings. You choose, you have this complex embeddings, choose one from each equivalence class. That equivalence class, the complex embedding is related by one and its conjugate. I pick up one. Okay. Then I have a formula. Write down the so we have we let us write down the you, 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 I mean, you have to work out by your you have to like you know you have to dirty your hand when you're doing all this. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, I cannot do it in a class. I guess so. There is a yeah. So here is the. I would like to have this. Yeah. So uh, talking about J D F. Suppose F is a variety defined over. Uh, F is a V is a variety defined over the number field. Then if I take the well restriction over Q of that variety V, that certainly define over Q, and I take the R points, the real points, that's going to be a manifold, manifold minus some certain things. So it's going to be a topological space. The topological space is going to be morphic to one such things. And where I'm choosing, I'm choosing a class of equivalence, I'm choosing one place for complex embedding, like, you know, Two complex embedding are like equivalent if they are conjugate. <coughs> and I am choosing each from one class and calling it by L plus one and this last one. So the real point, the important thing, the real point, there is a natural isomorphism that I mean, all this uh, calculation tells you. Uh, these are re real embeddings. So it makes sense to, so sigma i of f for these cases are sub subfield of real numbers. <coughs> so it makes sense to talk about the real points here. But here it doesn't make sense to talk about the real points because sigma l plus one is not inside real points. So we can all you can do is complex points, and which is what perfectly gives the formula. That the real point is like this, and you can simply replace this by a group defined over the number field. Okay, and we have the corresponding formula for the group. Yeah, I mean, I have written it, but I have forgot to note down the page, which is 22. Yeah, 22. So, and you have the corresponding, this, this is the thing. I mean, so if you have a linear algebraic group defined what k, then there is a natural isomorphism. So, this is going to be a Lie group. This is going to be a real Lie group. And this real Lie group is isomorphic to the following real group. So, there are some bunch of real Lie groups, and there's, there's a bunch of complex. So, this should be again. I guess, yeah. So, L plus 1. This should be C. So, these are a bunch of real Lie groups and these are a bunch of complex groups. Okay. Alright, so 
Moral Horizontal Theorem tells us So you see that if G is a semi-simple F group, then R, Rf Q over Z, this, this is going to be a semi-simple Q group. If the original group is a semi-simple group over here, then that is a semi-simple Q group. The borel standard theorem says that Z point is a lattice here. But this Z point is precisely going to be the OF points of G. Okay? So the Z points are going to be OF points of G, where exactly so we have this. So this is something. Z points are going to be the OF points under the suitable embedding. This is the ring of integers of F. And I consider this G12. Thing. You remember the I, when I got a description of the Q points, the Q points are going to be sigma 1 G to sigma R G, where G is in G of F. But the Z points are going to be sigma 1 G to sigma R G, where G is in G of O F, where O F is the ring of integers. Okay? So what I have got is this object, this object. So let me finally state the final uh, <coughs> yeah so this object this uh, this uh, this object under a suitable identification of a subgroup here is going to be lattice that's why we are very and these are the arithmetic construction of lattices and uh, let me be more explicit yeah, now if F is a totally real field, that means if all the embeddings are real embeddings, then I have this fact that this object, this, this is going to be lattice in this real field. And here is a toy example of the situation that is Like this tells us that SLM Z plus root two Z. So I take, take consider my F to be Q adjoint root two. This is a degree two extension, and it has a the embeddings are you know A plus root two B going to A minus root two B, and the other one is the identity one. So under that embedding, if you look at just this picture and here, then SLN Z plus root to Z inside SLN R. SLN R is a group defined over Q, so Galois, the coefficient uh, doesn't change. <coughs> SLN R as, you know, A plus root 2 B to be a minus root to be. This sits here as this, and this is so. So this is this, this, this one. A B from yeah A B yeah intersection. This as yeah Z, but a minus Z. Where, where this is this determinative yeah. one a plus <laughs> one this is going to be lattice here it is certainly discrete I mean uh, discreteness is very easy to see like you know uh, but to prove that it is a finite volume you probably need to go through this b a minus root 2 b yeah. A, B is in Z. If you think this is a inside <coughs> cross R, that's what it is. It's just a matrix one. So, what is the complex situation we are only talking about real Lie groups? 
So we have real embeddings, but if you have uh, some certain complex embeddings, here is the situation. Uh, the picture is like this. So I consider again, I, I, cut, I, you know, I pick up not all the complex embeddings, but complex embedding I up to uh, conjugates. Then I choose a bunch of them, fix a bunch of them. And take again G inside O F, but this time we take this group inside here. So that is going to be lattice in this group, like whatever the external. That is precisely the reason why an example of such a situation is S L N Z plus I Z, where I is the complex number, is a lattice. Because Z plus IJ, both the you know, all the embeds are complex embeds. So for QI, I join I. So I just pick one of them. So that is the only one factor. Okay. Okay, so this kind of construction tells me uh, to, uh, as I said in the beginning, so let us see a co compact lattice example of a co compact lattice. There is a co compact lattice. So. Yeah, it's written there, so I don't need to. So I take my Q root 2 again, uh, uh, quadratic extension of Q, and I choose my N to be P plus P, and J I choose to be matrix IP minus IP. Then I consider this uh, SOJ, that is, you know, in GL and C, so that determinant of X is 1, X, T, J, X is equal to J, that is SOJ. And this is certainly J, since the, all the elements in J are in. Q root 2, this is this group is defined over Q root 2, defined by polynomials in Q root 2. So, yeah, so J sigma, so yeah, so let us call J sigma 2. Sigma 2 be, yeah, sigma 2 to be the other embedding that A plus root 2 B go to point A minus root 2 B. Then sigma J sigma 2 I denote by J sigma 2 I denote this matrix. Then it is immediate to see that. Uh, so J sigma 2. So so J is a group defined over Q root 2, and so J sigma 2 is going to be precisely this group. Okay. So what is the real point of the first one? The first one, the real point is so PQR. Is a P minus Q. Hmm. And you see the minus 2 is going to plus 2. So that's why that's why so J sigma 2 of R is becoming so M R. So what have we got from uh, what we have written is the following that A plus sigma 2A, A belongs to SLN Z root 2 is going to be lattice in SOPQR times SONR. Yeah. But SONR is compact. So I can, so this lattice, SONR is compact means this, uh, these elements, unless it is identity, cannot be unipotent. One of the projection is compact. So sigma if A is unipotent, if that is unipotent, sigma 2A is going to be unipotent. So, but we are in a we are in a compact group, so we cannot have a unipotent element. So sigma 2. So this group cannot admit a unipotent element. So this is a co-compact lattice. So what we have proved is SO this this object, this A sigma 2A is a co-compact lattice in SOPQR times SONR. But you notice that I am I have just one factor of SONR which is compact. So if I project use the projection map from SOPQR cross SONR to SOPQ, this is a proper projection. So a co-compact thing, co-compact lattice will be co-compact lattice. So all we need to see is SLN Z root 2 is a co-compact lattice in SOPQ. And uh, SLNR uh, you can also construct lattices, SLNR as a Q form, which is an isotropic that can be seen using uh, existence of division algebras. With central division algebras, you have to get property that D tends are uh, so for any D, uh, there is a central division algebra D, which find out Q. The D tensor R is M and D. And from that, uh, you can have a Q form of SLN which is uh, coming from this D, and this D cannot have any point 
because t minus 1 to the power n is 0 means you know t minus 1 is 0 plus 0 and a division of the situation that gives us a co-compact <coughs> language. But otherwise also the Borel's trick is the how, how did Borel prove existence of a co-compact lattice that he basically got hold of a extension which is totally real. Then he showed that R points of all the non-trivial embeddings G of G of sigma of R for every sigma non-trivial is compact. That says that uh, you can do the same thing like S O P Q times S O P F. The same argument <coughs> that gives a compact lattice. And here you need totally real because the other thing is other embeddings. You cannot have a complex embedding because complex semi-simple yield groups are never compact. So uh, probably yeah. So I'll stop here. So you, you need for S O P Q S O S O N one would be the yeah, S O P Q particular S O N would be the one. So yeah, I construct a co-compact lattice. Uh, this is these are all standard in particular. Yeah. Okay.